Yep, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, so we have so far, uh, you know, 21 participants with us. We're expecting some more. Uh, till the time people join in, let me start with the introduction and all. Okay, great. And, and do you want me to go ahead and share the deck? The PowerPoint slides? Yeah, so once we start, uh, we can share okay. the deck. I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. So a very good evening to everyone who's joined here. A very good morning to you also, Maggie. It's morning right there. I, I know it's quite early. Uh, I'm Bhairavi from Beyond Diversity. I'm taking care of uh, the CSR vertical of Beyond Diversity. And I've been associated with Beyond Diversity for a long time now, for, since its inception. Uh, many of you might not have known me or met me. Uh, Beyond Diversity, as you all know, is working in, this, in the space of creating inclusive workspaces. And we are doing a lot of mentoring and coaching programs. We do these programs in order to kind of equip all the, you know, organizations as well as the employees to equip themselves with leadership skills and new business trends so that they can, you know, deal with the complex diversities that are there inside the workplace. Or along with that, they can deal with the diversities of the workplace. So we welcome you all to this webinar, uh, uh, Finding Your North Star by Maggie Chan Jones. I will give you a brief introduction about Maggie. Maggie is the founder and CEO of Tennessee, a tech-enabled innovative uh, coaching company that helps women advance their leadership roles and the boardroom. She is also an award-winning C-level executive board director, CMO, advisor, and angel investor who specializes in marketing, business transformation, and technology. In her 20-year career, Maggie ha has and continues to break new grounds as a woman of the color in the technology space. She was the first woman to become the global chief marketing officer at the SAP, the world's largest enterprise application software provider, and has been in leadership positions at Microsoft and Level 3 Communications. In 2019, Maggie was appointed to the board of directors as cybersecurity software company Avast. Once again, proving that age, gender, and race are barriers that can be overcome when women are confident, proven, and empowered. Maggie has uh, many you know, accolades to her uh, uh, CV. Frequently recognized as the thought leader, Maggie was named as the top 20 most influential CMOs in 2017 by Forbes. She's a recipient of Women of the Decade in Marketing, Branding, and Communication Award by Women's Economic Forum, acknowledged for creativity and storytelling by the CMO Club Awards. She has also been named the top 10 most interesting B2B executives, Women of the Year, among other accolades as well. So we welcome you, Maggie, uh, to this uh, interesting uh, webinar. We hope that the participants are going to you know, enjoy and kind of learn a lot of new things from this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I know it's towards the end of the day for you all. And um, so I want to be, you know, as interactive as we could be. So if you have any questions, feel free um, to let me know and or use the chat on the Zoom as well. So let me just um, start with this. Okay. So yeah, just, uh, just a second, Maggie, I'll just interrupt in between. I would request all the participants to please uh, put their, you know, uh, uh, the webinar on the mute so that we don't find any, you know, disturbing uh, typing uh, voices in between. And you can, put, if you have any questions in between, you can put it in the chat box. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, we can continue, Maggie. Thank you so much. And it's great to be with you. And today I want to share, you know, a few lessons, as you will, that, um, that I have learned along the way in my, you know, in my career journey to, to the C-suite, to the boardroom, and now founding my own company to help advance gender diversity, help more women into leadership. So, you know, I would say in our career is rarely linear and you know there are twists and turns so just like the pictures on your screen right now 
you know, if, you know, there are times that you know exactly what you wanted to do and you want to take the freeway um, so that you can get to somewhere faster. But in many cases, you know, t taking a scenic route on the right may be even more rewarding in terms of the experience that you would get. So, you know, so as you plan your career, in my case anyway, many of my roles that I have taken along the way are not necessarily just climbing up the ladder, but, you know, going across to get different learning, different experience as I go along. And second lesson that I've learned is it is important to take the path less traveled. What I mean by that is when, you, when you're taking a role that maybe other people are not thinking about or something that is so different, this really gives you an opportunity to shine. This really gives you an opportunity to innovate. I remember earlier in my career when I went to Sun Microsystems at that time, and um, I decided to join a smaller group that focus on the tele telecommunications industry where we focus on the storage business um, in, in that area. And in that case, it was a product that, um, that not many people actually knew within the company or focus on, but it allowed me to really drive a lot of innovative approach. And you know, when you fail, not as many people would know, but when you actually can do something amazing, that became a best practice for out of business units. And that's how, in a way, I got my create, you know, I got my creativity as well as credibility to enable me to get into the server group, which was, you know, the main group within the company at the time. So I always in my career kind of go you know, zigzagging in, in a way to allow me to really take some risks that, um, that the areas would allow that type of innovations and also taking some high visibility role where you would probably be a lot more focused on driving the, you know, driving the right approach because any failures could mean, you know, a, a, a very big impact to the company. And then another thing that I really learned along the way is following my internal compass. And I kind of look at that in three different areas. One is focusing on my personal values. And the other one is focusing on financial goals and also professional aspirations. I would say earlier in my career, a lot of my decisions in my career were focusing on professional aspirations. And it was very much about, wow, you know, when I grew, when I grow up, I want to be, you know, um, a group manager, a director, a VP, and so on and so forth. And, but as I continue to grow and in my mid-career, then I started to think more about financial goals. And I actually, my husband and I hired a financial advisor during that time because we wanted to know, you know, what does it, what, what do we need in order to get to financial independence so that we can choose whatever we want to do. And, um, you know, maybe we could choose to retire early. So having that financial advisor was very critical. And I would say that you know, men tend to invest early and women tend to save. So when you think about the return on investment, that we not only women tend to make less than men on the same job, at least, you know, in the U.S., um, but also women don't accumulate as much wealth because we didn't invest early. So finding that financial advisor early was very important into allowing me to now, two years ago when I founded my own company, to focus really on my personal passion. My personal values is really how do I make an impact to the next generation of women entering in the workforce, getting into leadership, getting into the C-suite and board group. So the third lesson is really around following your internal compass. That got to what I just talked about is founding Tenshi. 
Henshi's vision is to achieve gender equality in the workplace by you know, empowering leaders across the board, women and men, through coaching. And by doing so, we are enabling more leaders to accelerate their growth. And personally, why I chose coaching was that when I was a director of marketing at Microsoft 10 years ago, um, my mentor suggested that I get a coach. And, um, and I started working with my coach, Mary, ever since, and it's been 10 years. And having that confidant to be working with me, helping me to really unleash my authenticity was very critical. And the fourth lesson is be a change agent. Similar to talking about, um, talking about taking a path less travel is the importance of you know, being someone that people want to follow. And I talk to many women who are thinking about people management as an area that they want to grow into. And I always say that before you become a manager, then, you know, what would be a great way to showcase your leadership is that people want to follow you. And usually people want to follow leaders who are leading change, who can see a better future for the group, for the company. And being a change agent allow you to really create that vision for other people that want to be with you. And the fifth lesson is around thriving in a matrix environment. I know that when I look at the attendee list for today's webinar, many of you work in you know, mediums to large size organizations, and many of you also work in a multinational company. And being in a matrix organization seems to be you know, very, um, you know, very, pro very prominent in, in many of your day job. And in this case, it is so important to figure it out, you know, not only who do you work with immediately or who you report to, but understanding, you know, how do you influence and lead in a very matrix organization where communications become a very key area to really accelerate your growth. And like I said, you know, epic fail sometimes is okay. And I will tell you a story when, um, when earlier in my career, I actually got a new job within, um, within the company. And, and it was, you know, starting early in the 2000, um, 2009, 2010. Um, helping, you know, the company to grow the cloud computing, which was still very much in the infancy at that stage. And I actually decided, you know, um, to do a, you know, to do a roadshow for small and medium businesses to learn about cloud computing. And I remember um, my manager at the time was like, you know, Maggie, I would really love to um, participate and help you um, in this new endeavor. So feel free to send me to any locations. And, and of course I did. I sent him to one of the locations for, um, to manage one of the events. And it turned out there was only one person attended the event. And I didn't know. So I, when, you know, when my manager came back and I said, Dan, how did it go? And he kind of like, well, um, I had a really conversation with that one person because that was the only person who attended. And I was so embarrassed, you know, being not only, not only that, you know, I, um, I had an event that only one person attended, but you know, that was my manager and it was my new job. But that was also very, a very good learning experience for me, knowing that small and medium businesses, you know, especially for business owners, they just do not have the time to go out and spend half a day to attend an event. Um, to learn about something, you know, completely new at that time in, in terms of technology. So a better way for us to move forward 
was to actually do this kind of webinars like what we are doing right now. And of course, based on that learning, we were able to drive a lot of attendance through our digital strategy on using webinars. And, you know, so failing is okay as long as you learn the lesson. And I would actually say that innovations a lot of times have to happen through a lot of failures, a lot of pivots for us to get to the right spot. So the more things you try and the more that you can really adapt the, the mindset of learning and that is going to help you to continue to grow. And I would say along the way in my career, and I moved multiple times for my career with my family, and without a strong support system, I would not be here speaking with you. And first and foremost is, you know, your friends and family, right? When I moved across the countries in, in the U.S., it was really my family that, um, you know, that made that adventure worthwhile, that made that adventure fun because we could really explore a different area. We could explore, you know, building a new home together. And for us, um, home is really truly where my family is. And I also want to emphasize on the importance of sponsors and my coach and mentors. And I know that sometimes we kind of use these terms interchangeably. So I want you to actually know the difference and know who they are in your career as well. Mentors, which I would assume that every one of you have already. These are the folks that they have competencies, they have experience that you want to learn from, that you also want to get advice from. And, you know, for me, if, as I grew my career, I thought about mentors who could help me to be a better people manager. I had um, peer mentors whenever I went to a new company that allowed me to learn more about the culture of the company and, you know, and, and, and the landscape on how decisions are being made. My coach, I mentioned Mary, um, my coach is more like, you know, someone who really can hold a mirror in front of me and help me really understand who I am as a leader, who I am as a person, understanding my values and my sponsors. And this is very critical. I would say the fact that I was able to get to the top in the marketing function um, being a CMO was because I had sponsors along the way. They may look like mentors to you, but what is different for sponsors? They are the one that have the political capital that can help you to open doors to new opportunities. They are more senior to you in your organizations. You know, the one that is most logical would be your manager. Your manager can help you to get into new projects, get, you know, promotions, and his or her manager, your skip level manager, or their peers could also be your sponsors. Some of the sponsors in my career, including business leaders who are in the adjacent group, but because my projects were very much aligned to their goals. So I focus on ensuring that I align to my sponsors objectives in terms of the business impact that they want to drive. And I'm also making sure that I would report the progress on the initiatives that I was focusing on that align to their goals and also get, seek their guidance as I grow my career as well. And lesson number eight is to be a talent magnet. And as you continue to grow your career, and many of you I know on this call are already mid-career level or senior executive level, and you would know that you know being a talent magnet is so important, especially in today's world where the talent market is so tight, is you know, there's such a talent war out there. So when people know that you are a great leader, when people know that you always achieve results, and that is what people would want to work for you, and that is also how you can get the best talent on your team. 
And lesson number nine is putting first things first. Um, and, and what we call it the big rock. And I remember Stephen Covey and in, you know, in his book about seven habits of effective people, he talked about the importance of putting, you know, putting your big rocks in. Um, we tend to, in many of our jobs, you know, and I'll speak for myself, that you kind of get drawn into whatever is urgent at that moment. And sometimes they may not be the most critical things. And for me, it was very important to know at any given time, what are the things that are most important to me? And that would allow me to really hone in on what are the key areas that are important. So for example, even when I have, even when I have and still have very demanding roles, demanding jobs, I always make sure that I would have time for my family. I block out time specifically so that I can spend time, quality time, with my family. I also know that blocking out, you know, what I call the me time, you know, the Maggie's time, is also important. So every Monday night was my tennis night. And, you know, and knowing at any time on what my key initiatives are that I need to dedicate a focus, that would allow you to really think about what are the things that are critical and what are the things that are less critical. And that becomes very, very important in how you prioritize your time and how you prioritize your focus as well. And the 10th lesson and the last lesson in this case, um, in, in, you know, in this conversation is there is no one path that really is the right path per se. And people, you know, people I mentor, people I advise, um, they always ask me, you know, what is the right thing to do? And it is not so much about what is the right or wrong thing. It is really about what is the right thing for you. And your success re recipe is most likely going to be different from the person who are next to you and the people you're talking to. But really understand, you know, what is important to you. So the first thing I always think about are my personal values. What are things that are critical for me and, and how do I think about that? And then the second thing then is think about time. So as an example, when I was studying um, for my executive MBA um, and I was still working full time at the time, and I remember that for the first six months was very difficult because I felt like, you know, I wasn't doing as much as I used to be doing um, in my job. So I didn't feel like I was, you know, achieving the excellence that I wanted. And I also felt like I wasn't doing that well in school because I also had a full day, you know, full time job. So it wasn't until about six months in that I realized that, hey, at this moment in time, because I have a full time school program as well as a full time job, it is okay to take a step back a little bit and say, you know what? I'm not gonna get an A in everything, but if I can get a B in, you know, in both things that I do, that would be okay. And understanding that how I prioritize and being ruthless about time management was also very critical for me. And at that time, during that 18 months period, I would say that I probably didn't spend as much time with my friends and family, but that was okay because I also let them know that I was going through the executive MBA program. And whenever you are starting a new role, whether it is within the same company or you're joining a new company, giving yourself time to learn about the culture, learn about the people, learn about how decisions are made, and, um, and then figure it out how you get those early wins is going to be important as well. So depending on your situation, depending on where you are at in your career journey, depending on what's happening at your life at that moment, your success recipe would most likely be different as well. And one of the things that I really focus on is um, really understanding longer term, where do I want to go? That goes back to your career North Star, right? 
And when I know what my North Star is, and then it would be much easier to plan all those steps that are along the way because that helped you to anchor the direction that you want to go. And this is one of my favorite quotes and chance favors the prepared mind. You know, people always ask me, you know, do you believe in luck? Do you believe that, you know, your success is contributed by luck? And I said, absolutely. But luck is only one element. When the opportunity knocks, you want to be ready. You want to be prepared. So when those opportunities come along, that you can really capture that moment and take it all the way. And that is where preparation and, and also, you know, getting all your experiences, different competencies is going to help you to be prepared for that. And I can't emphasize enough, you know, people always say is, well, you know, I need to fit in. And when they're interviewing, even when I'm talking to executives that are interviewing for C-level positions, and I always say, you know, like, just be you. And because if being you is not what they're looking for, then this is probably not the right opportunity for you. So I would say have fun and really be the best version of you and really, you know, take every opportunity, take every conversation as a learning opportunity so that you get to know more about yourself. You need get to learn more about, you know, what you are capable of, what you really wanted to know and what you also really wanted to learn. And that is the most important piece. And with that, um, you know, I want to spend more time with you on more from the Q&A side because, you know, it's one thing about me talking is, but I really want this to be helpful to you in helping you to think through your career journey. So I would open up for um, any questions that you may have. Great. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Maggie, for, you know, putting in all these, uh, you know, lessons uh, of your life uh, into the uh, this presentation and I'm, sh I'm pretty sure that this has helped people understand their career graph as well. So I would request the uh, you know participants to come out with the questions. They can put it in the chat box and I'll read out. Any questions, participants? I want to just say, um, I probably say your names wrong. Um, Me too and Mahama, thank you so much. I really appreciate your messages in the chat. Yes. So here we have a question from Neetu. She's asking, after so many years of careers, do you have any regret or what could you you know, uh, just a second. I've done differently. Or what could you have done differently? Yes. Sure. Um, I would say regrets, no. And um, are there things I would do differently? Absolutely. There are so many of them. Um, and, and, and the reason why I say no to regrets, but doing things differently, yes, is because without those experiences, I wouldn't know more about myself. And you know, some of the some of the really, really good lessons actually come from things that, you know, I didn't do it right the first time. So one of the things um, that I would say um, I would and, and I did do it differently um, based on one experience was in um, when I was a senior marketing manager, I remember speaking with my um, my executive, and and at that time he was like, you know, Maggie, I real, you know, I was ready for another role and um, within the company, but the executive was like, you know, Maggie, I think, you know, it would be great if you do another role within this, you know, within my group, and I really want you to stay. And in my head, I was thinking, wow, you know, my executive personally asked me to stay. 
and um, this is someone who were like four or five levels above me. And of course I would stay. And little did I know that, you know, at that time, I knew I really wanted to go into a different group to learn the different skill set. But because my executive asked me to stay, and in my head, I felt like, of course, if you asked me to stay, this would be the right thing to do. So I ended up staying in the group, and I was really not happy in, in the role that I took um, within the same group. And, um, and I was, you know, not motivated, and, and that was probably the shortest role that I ever had in my career. And in about nine months, I was pretty much done with it. And the, the lesson learned from that was I will always, always from that point forward to all, always follow my heart and, you know, really trust your gut because your gut is something that really tells you what, what you really want to do. And when you're doing something you want to do, even during the tough times, you will rise above and be able to perform because that's what you choose to do that's what you want to do but outside of that lesson learned it was also great that it was during that role that you know because i was not motivated so i was looking at um you know i, I was looking at mba programs and that's actually the time that i got into my executive mba program so by the time that I get accepted to the program, I also um, landed within, you know, within the company into another role that I was super excited about. And, um, and, and that was really a great lesson for me. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Maggie. We have Pail here who's wanting to understand as to what would you recommend to someone who may be facing discrimination at workplace? Um, discrimination as in, I think, you know, um, I think first and foremost is really understand, um, you know, and, and, and to the extent, you know, without knowing the details of that scenario, for me, I always seek to understand first, because sometimes it could be a misunderstanding. And are there scenarios that, you know, I always try to seek the understanding and also share my perspective. And of course, you're the only one who would know in that scenario, what is the best way, you know, what is the landscape, what's the best way forward. In most cases, when I look at a scenario where I have disagreement or, you know, I don't really agree with um, the position of others, or even in some cases, my manager, I try to find a one-on-one -on -one time to have that conversation. Um, you know, so for example, I would have, I've had conversation with my colleagues where I was like, well, you know, I'm hearing something that was said about this situation. And I, you know, I want to know, and I want to, you know, actually look you in the eyes and, and A is to find out whether it is true. And B, if it is true, why is that happening? And how do we, you know, how do we resolve that? Or in a case where, you know, um, I may have disagreement in how we see things with my manager, I would, you know, request a one-on-one -on -one time with my manager and also share with him, you know, this is the situation I see. This is you know, this is how you handled it. And this is how, you know, this is how it makes me feel, or this is how I look at it. And I would, A, is always be objective, um, because you want to seek to understand, to ensure there's no misunderstanding. Two is you also want to be really calm so that you can truly have that dialogue. And there are also a point where, if none of those things work, then you have to really ask yourself, is this the right place for you? And how do you plan, you know, on moving on as an example, as a next step? Absolutely, Maggie. Thanks for that uh, insight. Uh, we have here Manasi, who is wanting to understand how can you become change agent, especially 
if you are in your career since 10 12 years sure um being a change agent you can be at any point in your career um i can even see that what i'm doing right now with tenshi is being a change agent if i look at you know across the world gender diversity or gender equality is still too far away from you know from being realized and you know driving change you know helping one woman at the time one leader at a time is sometimes it's really how you get started so i would say being a change agent you know when you're at work think about what are the areas that really need change and in today's world especially with the digital transformation age that we are in there are so many things that you could be a change agent in change agent in terms of you know how do you help the company to be more digital um change agent in how do you evolve you know with now four to five generations working in the workplace how do we get the maximum impact from the workforce um change agent as in helping um another woman to succeed um being a sponsor being a mentor to them and those are the ways that you know it, you could potentially start small and go big i would say don't think too much about boiling the ocean but finding things that you're passionate about and taking one step at a time yeah so we have saurav with us who is wanting to understand how can we you know prioritize uh, personal uh, and uh, official uh, pressures and also how to kind of you know manage multiple challenges at the same time yeah absolutely this is something that i think there is no one answer and you know and this is something that I personally still, you know, still have to work on every single day. I remember literally just two weeks ago, I had two mentors, um, you know, or people I look up to um, that said to me, "Hey, Maggie, it's great that you're doing all these things, but remember to always have time for yourself, and you know, remember to make sure you prioritize your own time as well." and those are really good reminder because for me as an example i am someone who always want to do more who always try to get to excellence so um and and i'm a problem solver so you know so many things that i see in today's world i'm like wow you know i can really help make a difference so really i would say going back and anchor yourself on what are those things that are important uh you know with any opportunities that come are those absolutely the things that you have to do or can someone else help you to do that um how do you outsource some of the things um or how do you get more help um and, and those are the things that i think you have to really sit down and map it out and I personally, you know, do that myself. So to give you an example, next week I'm going to be in Europe um for some meetings and um and in order for me to spend some time with my husband and who is actually on a business trip in Europe right now, we are actually meeting in a central location and doing a mini vacation for, you know, for two days on a weekend. And those are, you know, what I call like work life integration. Now, you may not necessarily have the luxury to do that in some cases and i think really understanding or you know if it is about family then how do you work with your spouse or your partner to map out you know what they do and what you do um and, and those are the things that i think is important and one of the things i always encourage um my team to do too is a is to always you know allocate time for yourself and b is to also let me know you know in in cases where you know if they need to be away um you know at a certain time of the day because you know their kids are going to um a football game or something like it is good to let people know so that you know they can anticipate and also 
teaching them in a way to help you to prioritize, you know, so that you can integrate more as well. Yeah. So we have here uh, Musarat who is wanting to understand how can she get the best out of mentor mentee relationship and how, how can we identify a best coach for oneself? Um, so in terms of the mentoring relationship, I would say as a mentee, um, the mentee will have to really drive that agenda. The mentor in this case is really helping you to, um, you know, to get the most out of that relationship, but you as a mentee would have to drive it. I always, you know, as a mentee, I would always, you know, send an agenda to my mentor ahead of time and say, you know, for today, I want to talk about these three things or one thing and really focusing on that topic or topics that would help your mentor to also think ahead of time on, you know, what are the things that they would start thinking about in preparation for that conversation. And, um, and I think, you know, always follow up, right? I would always tell people within 24 hours, you should send an email and just thanking them for their time and their advice. Um, if you could be more specific, that would be even better. And, um, or the key lessons you learn, because I personally feel like whenever I can put things in writing, that also helped me to learn better and to remember better. So that is one of the things that I like to do. Um, and, and then what was the second part of the question? This, uh, the second is from, uh, it was how to identify the coach, the best coach for yourself. Hmm. So in, um, I know that, you know, um, for me uh, at Tenshi, what we do is we always, um, you know, we always start out with having a conversation with our potential client first. And this is what we call our intake form and or intake conversation, really understanding their career journey, what their career aspirations are, what kind of coaches would work best for them. And, um, and, and then we identify two coaches um, that would be great for them to speak with. And, um, and then you really want to get to know your coach style um, what they could potentially do for you. And, and most importantly, really understand that chemistry. Because I always tell our clients is to go with your gut, go with what you feel is right. And, you know, we partner with Beyond Diversity and Beyond Diversity have some really amazing coaches as well. And I would highly recommend you talk to them. Yeah, thank you so much, Mangi. Mm -hmm. So we have Tulika who's wanting to understand that how often do you reset your North Star? How often? Um, as I would say, you know, it depends on, it depends on you really. Um, I would highly encourage you not change it every year, obviously, but um, but, you know, at a minimum, I would say, you know, you want to keep it three to five years, but some may be longer. Like when I decided I wanted to be a CMO one day, um, you know, it was, it was a long-term goal. And, and so that stayed with me and helped me to really anchor every role that I took since I decided that was what I wanted to do to ensure that I build my experience and competencies to achieve that goal. Um, but at the same time, you know, after the CMO, you, you know, I, I know that I wanted to help more women. I know that I wanted to serve on board. And those goals maybe, you know, that were faster for me to get to. And, and then, you know, then I will continue to refine what is next, you know, what does the next phase look like? And, um, so it really depends. And my, my guidance is whatever you set your goal to, try to build a path, try to build your career roadmap as you will, and figure it out what are the steps that you need to take in order to help your, you to get there. And uh, I don't know about you, but for me, 
I'm someone that until I reach my goal, I just, you know, I'll just keep trying. Um, and, you know, but at the same time, I also know that sometimes life situations happen or when you have new experiences, you may decide that, you know, whatever you put on paper as your North Star no longer is something that you want to do. And then in that case, absolutely, it would make sense to change it. Yeah, thank you so much. So mm -hmm. here we have Salma who is wanting to understand as to how can one deal, you know, with uh, certain fears that one un uh, goes through when one has certain challenges in the organization. They are, you know, they are working with their senior management and they find challenges into some of their ideas. So, and they, they fear that what if they failed with their ideas? How do we do, deal with such situations? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, so I want to make sure I understand it correctly. Uh, she's wanting to understand if, you know, we are challenged by our senior uh, supervisors and if they have some sort of fear in them, uh, thinking that they would fail. So how do mm -hmm. they deal with such situations? So I always believe in taking risks. But you have to take calculated risk. What I mean by that is, you know, when you are taking risk, you want to be, um, you know, you want to be in your best position to win. So not just taking risk for, for the sake of taking risk, right? So let's say if I'm going, you know, when I'm doing a project, that I've never done before. And just like, you know, in my early days in the cloud, it was so new that we just didn't know what would work and what didn't. And we try a lot of different, you know, different ways to do marketing, um, different focus on different audiences to really understand who are the right audience who would be the early adopters. Um, what are the, you know, what, what would be the right messages that would resonate with different audiences? And then from there, you kind of learn, okay, you know, like you start narrowing a path that would help you to double down on what would be the right strategy. So my point is, um, taking risks is really about doing something that you don't know the outcome. And there will be some risks that, you know, that will pay off and there will be some that, that don't. So, but I always believe that if you don't try, you would never know. So I would really go for any, you know, I always say go big or go home. Um, so I go for big challenges. I, you know, I do everything I could to ensure that I could be successful in what I do. But sometimes it just doesn't yield the result and that would be okay. Now you may say, wow, you know, that's a big risk in your career. And that is true. And sometimes it happened. Um, so it's really depending on your risk profile and what you're willing to take. And for me, I know that for a lot of senior executives, the reason they were senior executives were before, was because they took you know, risk along the way. And even if you fail in one area, you could try in another area. And that would be, you know, that would be what I did. Yeah, so, so rightly put, Maggie, you know, you we need to have calculated risk, risk when we are uh, adapting to a new idea. Uh, there is someone mm -hmm. called Ankita wanting to understand as to how can we, we be firm with our views without being impolite? One of the things that I always do, especially when I'm introducing a new idea, is... Um, Let's say, you know, you have this important meeting that is coming up and you have to introduce this very new idea um, and you don't know how people would react. I would always spend the time to reach out to those individuals one-on-one -on -one ahead of the meeting. And I would say, you know, hey, knowing that we have this meeting coming up, can I get, you know, can I get 15 or 30 minutes of your time? I would love to get your thoughts on, you know, on, on, on my idea. And 
nine times out of 10, people would say, absolutely, I would love to, you know, spend some time. And that's the way I would call it, you know, that is how you get your early buy-in. And so if you do that enough, by the time that you walk into that meeting, you would have, you know, everyone would have already know your idea and you would already know who are the supporters and who would actually support you in a meeting and you know what could potentially be the objections that were coming in from and you'll prepare for it so that you can really drive a fruitful conversation and i would say you know this is especially important when it comes to an executive conversation yeah thank you so much maggie for this i'll just uh, yeah i don't think we have any more questions would you like to add something? Well, I would say thank you so much for your time today. And I really, really love all the questions and all your comments coming in. And this is exactly what I wanted to do is to make this as impactful and useful for your time being spent with us. And um, thank you so much to Beyond Diversity for, in, for inviting me to speak at this webinar. And best of luck in your career journey. And I have my email here. Um, so feel free to email me if you have any additional questions. Right. Um, so let me take this opportunity, Maggie, to thank you so much for this wonderful webinar, you know, uh, trying to uh, share all your personal uh, lessons that you've learned on the journey towards your career with the participants. And uh, participants had a wonderful time in this uh, webinar and they've you know, gained a lot of insights out of your uh, presentation. So thank you so much for taking our time and, you know, uh, enlightening the participants here on behalf of beyond diversity and my team i really thank you so much thanks everybody have a good evening good evening bye bye thank you so much so for the participants we have our uh, webinar recorded we'll be sharing this webinar with all of you out there we'll be now you know calling off the meeting thank you so much all for joining us Bye-bye. Have a good evening.